Well, it's interesting how the book began. Uh, I was working uh, as a part-time teacher in an inner city school in an area of Toronto known as the Jane Finch Corridor. Mm -hmm. And the uh, area had a reputation of uh, being a tough neighborhood. Um, I had just gotten married um, at 22 years old and I was looking um, to find some employment and I wanted to become a high school teacher. But in Toronto in those days, and we're talking about the 1970s, you had to have a two-year diploma from Toronto Teachers College. And I was only able to uh, get a one-year diploma, which meant that I could only teach Primary. Primary and middle school. Mm. So um, I found a job uh, at a school which um, was considered one of the roughest schools uh, in the city. And uh, teachers uh, were very reluctant um, to teach there. And uh, the school was having trouble finding teachers and teachers were often um, away. You know, they would call in sick or um, they couldn't make it to class. So they needed somebody to go and substitute. And uh, I became that substitute. And I remember uh, one of the first times I entered the school, there was a teacher, uh, a male, uh, in his 30s, I guess, who was pounding his head against the wall with such force that blood was streaming down the wall. Uh, that wasn't a good sign. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and yet, over time, in working with uh, these young people, mostly new immigrants to Canada, a large Jamaican population, mm -hmm. but there were, oh, 40, 35, 40 languages spoken at the school. Not in the school, but at home. Um, I managed to develop a, a pretty close bond with my classes. And they would often put me out in a portable, which is a classroom that uh, is a temporary classroom outside of the main building. And uh, I just decided to throw out all the chairs and desks and to put some couches and pillows inside mm -hmm. and uh, a set of drums. So some days we would just drum, we just like we'd just drum all day. And uh, I just didn't feel it was important sometimes to even deal with any specific subject matter. I wanted to bond with the students. And actually, I identified with them in a unique way. I think I felt a certain kind of affinity because I always felt in my own life like an outsider, um, partly because I grew up working class. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like I didn't fit in. I had a chip on my shoulder, I think. Um, and uh, I didn't have a particularly good experience in school uh, in the primary and, and intermediate grades. Uh, I did have two high school teachers who were kind of avant-garde and, and took an interest in me mm -hmm. and tried to cultivate uh, um, some of my writing skills. And I, I really appreciate them for that. And so here I was in a position for the first time of actually being a teacher. So I had this sort of countercultural background from this, my experiences in the 60s. Um, and I, I was going to take a different approach to teaching. But I had, not, I had no real pedagogical theory. Mm -hmm. 
um, the pedagogical training that I'd received in Toronto Teachers College was pretty mainstream. It was pretty uh, conventional. Traditional. Yeah, traditional. And I just basically threw that out the window. Um, I created a pretty, um, I was going to say mystical, I wouldn't say mystical, I'd say magical space in the classroom. Uh, people used to come and just take pictures of the inside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'd collect things that I'd find, like d old doors, you know, I'd hang doors from the ceiling. I just, you know, it was just, uh, you know, we had mobiles turning around and we do a lot of artwork and it was just a, a very unusual space. Um, and I developed a, a reputation for, for um, well, first of all, for surviving in the school, but secondly, for actually, um, actually forming the kind of bonds that I think are necessary mm -hmm. to produce some kind of really interesting um, work with the students. And I was offered a full-time position. And I stayed there for approximately five years. I was trying to find my own way as a teacher. I had a great mentor. He was called the Hugging Principal. And uh, what he did, and, uh, and, and he really helped me, uh, I think, become um, a creative teacher. What he did was he got a sledgehammer and he smashed the wall of his office, this is the school principal, and put a rocking chair in the place of a desk. And all day, uh, the students from grade two, three, four, five, and six, would line up to be hugged. Now, that could never happen in the U.S. today with all kinds of lawsuits, you know, hugging kids. But he was the hugging principal and he would sit in his rocking chair and kids would just come and he'd give them a hug. And, uh, but it was, a, it was a very difficult setting um, and so I kept a diary. I did it largely speaking to uh, to cope emotionally mm -hmm. with the kinds of situations. But it became a bestseller, right? It became a bestseller, I think, because um, I think it became a bestseller for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Um, I collected a lot of stories, narratives, vignettes of things that happened to me sometimes things that happened to other teachers, things that I think shocked a lot of Canadian readers. Uh, I mentioned uh, snipers shooting the windows out of a school, uh, out of our, out of a classroom when we were at recess, um, parents bringing trained dogs to attack teachers that uh, they felt might be abusing their children, children that were abused at home, sometimes strapped to a table and burned with cigarettes. So the stories that I think made the book a bestseller were stories that had to do with, with violence. So there was a sensationalist element to the book. Mm -hmm. um, not every story was a story about violence. Some stories were tender. At that time in Canada, there had been any books that I was aware of that gave the public a glimpse of what it would be like to teach in an inner city school. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, um, the publisher, uh, I think, gave me good advice from its commercial standpoint, but bad advice in terms of actually um, creating a, an important political project about schooling and education. Um, I tried in the book, in the diary, initially, to analyze what was happening. Mm -hmm. I just sort of went and talked about poverty. I talked about um, issues around um, learning in, 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 and, uh, and poverty. And uh, I talked a little bit about capitalism, 
and inequality, but it was done in a very crude way. The publisher said, Peter, look, stop editorializing. I want to take out all your reflections, all your explanations about um, why you think things happened the way they did. Mm -hmm. And I protested initially, but they said, look, um, you've got a bestseller. <coughs> and more to the point, uh, you need to let your audience make up their mind about what they feel about the stories you're telling. You don't want to tell them what to think. You want to provoke them into making their own minds up about what they're reading. And they said to me, the editors, let the events speak for themselves. Now, that sounded profound to me as a young man mm -hmm. uh, writing his first book. But when I reflected on this a little bit later, after the book was published, I realized that no event speaks for itself. Every event has a contextual specificity and, and speaks within a particular context. And it's not neutral, right? It's not neutral. There are cultural factors. There are structural factors. There are, I mean, you know, um, all these kinds of things. And, uh, and I paid a dear price for, for uh, omitting any kind of inter in interpretation because what I did basically by removing my voice, uh, I left my book open. The author was dead, right? The author was dead and other people felt very free to move in and claim that they, that they knew what the book was all about. And I told a story about listening to a radio show when I was driving to class, my PhD um, mm -hmm. course. I'd gotten into a PhD program. I had a best-selling book. I had took a leave of absence uh, from my school board. Um, and I was feeling that I'd done something really important and worthwhile by writing the book. And I was uh, listening to a, to a radio show in the car on my way to class. And uh, it was an interview, actually. Um, the, the radio host was interviewing a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, why are they wasting time? interviewing a racist. You know, the time would be better spent interviewing me, maybe about my book. But I listened to the interview, and eventually, um, you know, it was a predictable interview, and it started to wind down. And, uh, and the host said, well, thank you very much uh, for your participation. He said, wait, 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 can you give me a few more minutes? He said, I'll give you about 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, the white supremacist said, I want to recommend a book for all Canadians to read. And he said, OK. Peter McLaren's book, Cries from the Corridor. Now, I slammed on the brake so hard, I almost went through the front windshield. Um, and I started to shake. And I thought, my god, how could a white supremacist recommend my book? Well, that's precisely the question that the host asked the, uh, the racist. He said, look, I know that book. Why would you, somebody with your racist views, promote a book like Peter McLaren's Scribes from the Corridor? And he said, well, because when you see how these dark-skinned people act like animals in his classroom, you're going to want to change the immigration laws mm -hmm. and keep those people out. That gave me pause. Right? I thought, uh-oh, um, never expected this to happen. But I went into a defensive mode because, um, well, you have to survive psychologically, right? So I thought, well, people use the Bible to promote all kinds of terrible things. This guy just happened to be using my book. So I let it pass. But um, I became aware 
that the community was very upset with me for writing this book. And I found that disturbing since I wrote the book to help the community, to help the kids. And it had a counter effect. It had a counter effect. I wasn't prepared for that. I think I was very naive. Um, there was a big meeting that was organized by the North York School Board in York Woods Library, which held about 500 people. And I was asked to come to speak to defend my book, write it in the community. Inside the library was that the leader of the West Indian community approached me. She asked for the microphone. I gave it to her. She looked at me. There was silence in the auditorium. And she said, Peter, we loved you as a teacher. You, you, you spent hours and hours and hours after school in our community. We wish you'd moved to our community, but you didn't live in our community, but you spent a lot of time in the community visiting parents in prison, uh, visiting, uh, you know, come, coming to, to our homes for dinner, for lunch. Um, and we appreciated that. And you really took an interest in the kids in our community. But you also, by writing this book, have stigmatized us. Because now people are looking at us as subhuman. Not only that, uh, a lot of the young people in our community don't really have a good self-image. And they're looking for something to identify with. They're identifying with your book. You know, they're, they're, they're calling themselves, you know, the toughest kids in Canada. You know, I painted them sort of as, as rough kids and, uh, and dangerous in some instances, and they're trying to live up to the image that you've given them. And this was a response that I had not anticipated. Um, if, if there was a break-in or there was a robbery, then indirectly, in a sense, I was being blamed because the kids were acting like the kids in McLaren's book. So I ha began to have serious doubts about writing the book. And then I was critiqued, of course, um, by uh, you know, sociologists, etc. And, and I, I had you know, a lot of great response to the book, but I had some pretty scathing reviews. After I was confronted by the community, I began to self-reflect, but I also began to engage in uh, a rigorous uh, program of uh, educating myself, largely by reading uh, Paulo Freire, Critical Theory. Um, I, I read in uh, any number of disciplines, sociology, right, uh, phenomenology, um, I read in uh, um, uh, literature, right? Uh, I read in the anthropological tradition. And so I was really on a quest uh, to learn a lot more about um, who I was, where I was, and uh, what my mission in life was going to be. And also how I could have made the mistakes I made when I wrote the, the diary initially. And so um, uh, eventually, I was invited um, to the United States by Henry Giroux. Uh, that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when I finished with my PhD, I worked for a year in, uh, in a small Canadian university, Brock University, mm -hmm. on a one-year contract. I was so politicized by then that my contract was not renewed. Mm -hmm. right? uh, students were excited by my classes. They were beginning to ask questions. These were teacher educators, right? These were mostly teachers that were in a teacher education program. And uh, so my contract, predictably, was not renewed. And I had to find a job outside of Canada. And uh, 
in uh, my PhD dissertation, which was an ethnography of a Catholic school, uh, was picked up by Routledge, a very um, prestigious publisher in London, England. And so I, uh, I sent it to Henry Giroux to see if he would do a preface to the book. And not only did he agree, but he said, come on to the States, work with me, we'll start a cultural studies center, and we'll start to reinvent and rethink and revolutionize education here in the United States. Well, I couldn't turn that down. My family was reluctant to leave Canada, but we, we headed to the Midwest, uh, and I had an eight-year uh, sojourn uh, in the U.S., in the Midwest, working with Henry Giroux, which was quite an education in itself. At that time, I was approached by American publishers who wanted to publish Christ in the Corridor, but I refused. They said, look, you know, um, you would have a really large audience here for this book. And uh, I said, no, I'm not interested. Uh, I think it was a mistake to write that book, and I'm going to have to turn you down. And the pub some publishers were quite persistent. They thought that I would break down and eventually say yes, mm -hmm. but uh, I said no. Then I thought about it a little bit more, and I said, okay, I agree that you can publish the diary if you let me turn the book into a pedagogical experiment. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'll let you publish the diary if I can become self-critical and, criti and basically criticize myself and the path that I had taken as an educator um, when I was working in the uh, elementary school in the Jane Finch Corridor. And so they thought about it for a while and eventually they said okay. So the book um, became known as Life in Schools. Then what I do and what's new in Life in Schools is I introduce the reader to basic central concepts in critical theory, in critical sociology, right? Um, and, uh, well, for instance, the concept of ideology, the concept of hegemony, the concept of social reproduction, the concept of resistance, uh, you know, issues around social class. You actually mentioned that during the, the promotion that uh, um, the students come out from American schools and basically Western schools uh, formed as consumers mm -hmm. more more than anything more than a sure. critique critical thinkers yeah and uh, you also mentioned uh, in your vocabulary the word yeah. revolution revolutionary repeats a lot so uh, if uh, if I ask you a question about uh, uh, connecting your book mm -hmm. which life the first version of life right. in schools, and the book uh, uh, Che Guevara, Paulo Freire, and Pedagogy mm -hmm. of Revolution. Uh, how, how would you how would you explain that? What happened in b between? Uh, mm -hmm. I, is there is there some kind of a, a difference in your thinking from? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think yes. I th I met Paulo Freire in 1985 when I first came to the U.S. And in 1987, Paulo Freire invited me to Cuba, to Havana, uh, because he was going to be speaking there. Um, actually, when I arrived, he'd already left. Um, but it was the Pan American Psychology Association Annual Convention, something like that. And I remember uh, going to Cuba for the first time. And uh, that really changed me, it transformed me, actually. Um, visiting communities, um, very poor communities, uh, communities that were, were struggling, uh, spending time with teachers, with teacher union leaders. Eventually, I began to give talks and work with groups in Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Peru, you know, Costa Rica, and, uh, and that, that really changed me and I think transformed me and deepened 
what I would call a revolutionary consciousness. Um, and I decided to write a book about Che Guevara and Paulo Freire. Now, um, I wasn't sure what Paulo would have thought of that because at the time Paulo had passed away, but uh, on one of my trips to Brazil I happened to um, be seated near Nita Freire, Paulo's widow. Hey Peter, hey Nita, you know, and we got a chance to talk a little bit during the flight. Mm -hmm. And I asked Nita, what do you think Paula would think of me doing a book about Paulo and Che Guevara? And she said, I think he would really uh, be pleased, Peter. He was a great admirer of Che Guevara. He even mentioned Che in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But Che, of course, is a very, very important figure um, in the fight against U.S. imperialism. And uh, I became very disturbed by my adopted country. I was prior to going there, mm -hmm. but I thought, you know, you're always hoping that you're going to take a different path. Um, you're always hoping that things are going to get a little bit better in time. And uh, in time, the U.S. kept bombing more cities and kept, uh, uh, kept up its pretense of humanitarian intervention, mm -hmm. which of course was just another code word right, for, for, uh, uh, for imperialist aggression. If we want to support our country, then we need to take an honest look at it and be able to debate, right, debate foreign policy, debate domestic policy, debate education policy, right? And um, that wasn't happening in the schools. Now, um, somebody would say to me, well, are you talking about this pedagogy of revolution? Is it really about, you know, overturning the, the, uh, the forces and relations of production? Uh, don't you think that's overly ambitious, Peter? I feel that teachers can work within the system wherever they find themselves and try to make the system a little bit better. Um, Student-centered curricula, for instance, uh, involving students mm -hmm. in, in, um, in constructing their own program of study, uh, bringing more dialogue, working with students' experiences, making things better. That's good. Reforming the system, making it less authoritarian, more interactive, maybe using more digital technology or whatever is your sense of expertise. But at the same time, having a larger political vision of what the possibilities are for creating a world in which uh, unnecessary suffering occurs in such massive proportions as we see it today. So I'm interested in creating, see, in other words, Revolutionary critical pedagogy is dual-pronged, it has a double prong. On the one hand, it's committed to reforming the system and working within the system. On the other hand, it's committed to creating a world in which inequality, right, no longer exists. The gap between the rich and the poor, the, the, the depth of inequality in our society today is growing exponentially and it's ferocious and it's absolutely destructive any way you look at it. So um, I don't see any real hope for education uh, within neoliberal capitalist society. So I'm working to try to build a vision an alternative vision for the future that doesn't require us to, um, to be slaves, right, basically. Uh, and uh, we're not dependent on wage labor to survive. Right? And at the same time, I am committed to working within the system to try to do the little things I can to make it better.
Now, where am I looking now to find some uh, shafts of light in the darkness? I'm finding uh, social movements in Latin America to be very, very inspiring. I'm talking about the Zapatista movement, the, la the landless uh, mm -hmm. you know, peasants movement in, in, in Brazil, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement in, in New York, uh, while it was going, was quite inspirational. Um, but I'm finding other autonomous movements um, and youth movements in particular to be especially inspiring. And so um, that's, that's my particular commitment. I can't help not thinking about local context, mm. Serbian context, right? Mm. And uh, as you might know, we suffer from what we call the surplus of history, right? Mm. Uh, and reflected uh, on the educational practices, it just causes lots of problems because you can't keep, basically, keep up with, with the pace. And then um, recently, uh, I was actually going through the textbook, history textbook, uh, that was proposing a completely new approach to history, the, the, the history uh, by offering uh, just the pure documents. Mm. So there's no comment. Mm -hmm. So there is a diary of the girl who was a witness to the war. There is a diary of a grandpa that witnessed the war, but from the different ethnic perspective. And uh, what do you think about that kind of approach in terms of critical pedagogy? Well, I think it has, I think it has some really important potential. Actually, um, I think that uh, as a textbook, however, um, you'd want to pose some problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't just simply leave the documents as documents. To the teacher. Yeah. I would have a selection of possible questions. Um, suggest questions, not impose questions, as a way of helping the teacher um, uh, create a space of genuine dialogue among the students and among the students and the teachers. So as a way of helping to uh, stimulate. Uh, um, I would also want to include role play. Mm -hmm. I would want to have um, young people uh, uh, um, to create a kind of empathetic dialogue to take the, the part of different, to, of different characters in those documents, for instance. Um, but the question, of course, I think this is the key point in critical pedagogy. And something I think should be emphasized is the question of voice, mm -hmm. right? Because to be voiceless is powerless. To, is to be powerless. To be voiceless is to be powerless. I want to give you one example of this moment, but it's an example of a teacher who's politically correct, but pedagogically foolish. Um, there was a movie made by Jodie Foster, I think it was called The Accused, and it was about a woman who's raped. In the movie, she's raped on a uh, pinball machine. Mm -hmm. um, but in real life, the movie was based on a real life incident in which a young woman was raped, I think, in, in the United States, in a, she went into a, I think it was a Portuguese social club. Anyway. Uh, it was a big story, I remember, years and years ago, I remember, it was a big story in the United States, right? Big controversy. Well, a teacher wanted to discuss this incident mm -hmm. with her class. And I think that's great. Uh, and uh, so uh, she brought the event up with her, with her class. And uh, there was a, a young Latina student, 
named Maria in the classroom. And she raised her hand. And the teacher called on her. And Maria said, you know what? I think that woman that got raped is real dumb. Uh, in my neighborhood, we don't do stupid things like that. We wouldn't be stupid. We're street smart. We wouldn't be stupid enough to go into a club that we'd never been in before. You know, I don't think she was, she was very smart, and, and uh, it's not something my friends and, and I would ever do, you know. Well, the teacher looked at Maria and said, Look, Maria, a woman has a right to go anywhere in this country in, 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 in any city, in any town, in any village throughout the entire United States and not have to fear for her safety and fear the kind of violence that occurred um, when this woman walked into that club. Well, of course, the teacher was right, but what she did was she took Maria's voice away. She silenced Maria. Mm -hmm. And again, to be voiceless is to be powerless. For the rest of the year, Maria remained silent. Now, the teacher was right, politically. The teacher had a very strong feminist sensibility. But pedagogically, she silenced Maria and took Maria's voice away. Uh, and so I think the question, of course, in, with critical pedagogy is to challenge the viewpoints of students without taking away their voice. Mm -hmm. And there are ways of doing that. There would have been ways of responding to Maria that would not have silenced her voice. Well, there was a case once in uh, the US um, many, many years ago, and I remember it. Uh, it was about a subway, a subway killer, actually, a white guy that was in a subway in New York City. He was approached by four African-American youngsters. He felt threatened. He pulled out his gun, and he shot them. I can't remember if, if the African-American uh, youngsters were killed or not. I think maybe some were, but they were seriously injured. And there was a big debate in the country at that time about whether this white guy um, was entitled to do what he did. Of course, we have the Trayvon Martin case right now in the United States in which uh, a young black uh, um, man was shot just because uh, the person that shot him felt threatened. Mm -hmm. It's called the Stand Your Ground Law. Stand your ground. If you feel threatened, you have the right to shoot and kill somebody. Right? That's today's version. Well, um, back to the original story. A teacher decided to raise this issue about the subway killer with, with the class. And the teacher said, OK, class, um, I want this side of the class to defend the white man who shot the black teenagers. This side of the class, approach. I want you to um, take the position, you know, uh, where you're against the shooter mm -hmm. and you think of a good argument and a good case to make and you come into to the class tomorrow in this group, you go to this side of the room, in this group, you go to this side of the room and we can have a debate. Well, the next day, the class meets, everyone moves to this side, everyone moves to that side, and one young woman decided to stay in the center of the room and not move her chair. And the teacher was really upset. And the teacher said, Andrea, you didn't do what you were required to do. I told you yesterday that you had to be part of this group and that you had to come into class and be prepared to take this position in the debate. And Andrea looked at the teacher and said, you know what, um, I'm not moving. And I'll tell you why I'm not moving. Because on the one hand, I'd like to go into a subway and not have to watch my back, not have to fear for my safety, 
um, that someone might shoot me or stab me. On the other hand, I don't like the fact that this white guy blew away four of my brothers. So she was defending the right to hold two contradictory opinions simultaneously. But what the teacher did, of course, in approaching her was to take her voice away and to silence her. And so the question is, um, how do you challenge students' viewpoints without taking away their voices? Hey, you know what? I was in a school in Chicago. There are about 40 gangs in Chicago. Uh, and uh, this was a Puerto Rican high school. And some of the students uh, got beat up by the El Rucans, right? There's a Latin Kings, the Spanish Cobras, the El Rucans. The El Rucans were like a black gang, right? So they beat up the Por Puerto Rican kids. They came into class and said, we hate black people. Why? Well, because they just beat the shit out of us, you know? Um, and, you know, it was really interesting. Um, how do you challenge that racism, right? As a teacher, I'd want to challenge that racism. Now, how did the, stu how did the teacher in this particular classroom approach that issue in a very critical way? The teacher would ask questions like, well, how many here have had a similar experience? Um, well, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about what they just said? And through a certain kind of selective questioning, um, he started to build up a very productive discussion in class. And eventually he said, you know what? You, you know, we're Puerto Rican. And he gave a history of Puerto Rico. He said, we're part Taino Indian, African, and Spanish. So, you know, really saying that you hate black people is basically saying you hate yourself. So, I mean, he, was, he, he had a very different kind of approach. He challenged the racism of these students without taking their voice away, right? Without silencing them. They, could, they were treated um, as human beings, but at the same time challenged. So you can do that with racism, homophobia, sexism, patriarchy. There's always a critical way to approach these issues. Um, does does that approach help actually resolve the problem in, t in historical ways, so let's say? Well, I, I don't know if, if there's ever a way to entirely resolve mm -hmm. a problem. Uh, there's no guarantee to critical pedagogy. There's just absolutely no guarantee. You can have, a, you can have critical pedagogical approaches and there's nothing about the approaches that are going to guarantee a particular result. You know, you can never say that after this class, after this program, so-and-so is going to have a critical consciousness. Um, you have to accept the fact that there are no guarantees. Um, and, you know, you, there's no fail-safe method. Uh, to resolve issues like racism or sexism uh, or, you know, xenophobic nationalism. Um, now, but what's interesting is this. Um, look, in the U.S., uh, it's very easy to be able to take a position without having an argument, right? So basically, if you're in a classroom, in the US, you'll see students say things like, well, that's your opinion and I've got mine. Good for you. Yeah, good for you. That's your opinion, my opinion's different. As if everything was simply an opinion. There's a real difference between having an opinion and making an argument. So critical pedagogy is dedicated to helping create coherent arguments, teaching students to make, or giving them the opportunity to be able to make strong, powerful arguments uh, and not just simply retreat. It's just too easy to say, well, that's your opinion. You know, that's your experience. I've got a different experience. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Experiences, you only learn from experiences that you learn from. In other words, 
you don't have experiences, you have experience of facts. And I, I honestly believe that in some way you can change your own history mm -hmm. by re-understanding your experiences. You can change your own past in a sense. So that critical pedagogy, as I understand it, is living life every day through a ph philosophical engagement with praxis. Right? It's developing a disposition, a way of life. That's what critical pedagogy is, the introduction into a disposition towards everyday life uh, that begins with an ethical commitment to the poor, an ethical commitment to the oppressed, uh, and a commitment to social justice. Right? It's a pedagogy of commitment. That commitment is prior to any theory. Ethics is prior to epistemology. Mm -hmm. That commitment becomes first, comes first. And the theoretical issues are, are, are still important, but they're secondary to that ethical commitment to social justice and economic justice. Carmen, se me perdió la cadenita con el Cristo del Nazareno que tú me regalaste, Carmen, que tú me regalaste, que tú me regalaste. Carmen, por eso no voy a olvidarte si ahora te llevo dentro, Carmen, muy dentro de mi pecho, a ti y al Nazareno. Y el riso de tus cabellos.